Today's topic is about escaping standards. Do you want to know what my brain thought when I heard that? Do weird stuff to prove your point. Right now, you might be predicting my future. This guy is going to ruin his outfit. But I have signs on my side. So what's actually happening here is that the pressure inside this can, by shaking, only increases slightly. What actually happens is that the air that is on top of the can got distributed throughout the can, and due to some impurities on the inside of the can, some air bubbles form. If I released this ticking bomb right now, that's a weird thing to say, um, it would be splashing all over the stage, ruining this carpet and everything, but there's actually research about it. If you tap slightly all over the soda can, what I'm actually doing right now is releasing these air bubbles going up so that they don't take all the soda with them. And it's actually a little bit tricky because I haven't told anybody of the organizers that I'm going to do this. And in my tests, about 90% it worked. <laughs> But I'm pretty confident. To predict the future, we actually must look into the past. Future predictions are not just for fortune tellers. You, dear audience, also have to make decisions for your own future. What should I write my thesis about? Should I take this job in this industry? Having a sense for the future can really help you with those decisions. Today, I want to share with you a way to develop a sense for the future. My name is Tian, and I really love building software products. As we heard today already, creating a software product, and especially creating a great one that actually solves a problem, takes a lot of time. So you would have to know, so it's best to know, what the future will look like, how people are going to live. So I wanted to improve my skill in this future prediction thing. And what I did was some research. And while I did my research, I stumbled upon a cool story that I would like to share with you because it changed me from very arrogant towards the past to actually improve, uh, embracing it. That's today. And we're going back for the story to 1899. This video footage is actual footage from 1899, Paris. The streets are crowded with people. Their main transportation method is the horse. Here and there within the video, you will be able to spot one of these new innovations, the motorized car. Owning one back then, is the equivalent of driving a Tesla today. As you can see, people are walking around, and as it's 1899, people are preparing for the new century. France lived through a century of wars and revolutions, and they had an image problem that they wanted to solve. And what did they do? They wanted to host the Exposition Universelle, the World Fair. They invited people all over the globe. They expected more than 50 million people to come. So around this event, a task force was created. This task force was led by Jean-Marc Coté, and their task was to imagine the future in 2000 and draw this future into drawings. Unfortunately, due to financial distress, the pictures were not published back then. Only 80 years later, a science fiction writer found them 
and publish them. I have them here for you today. I find them very powerful because on the one hand, it shows the time that they were predicting and we actually live in this time. On the other hand, it shows a lot of hopes and dreams the people had back then about how the future will look like. So let's start. As you can see clearly, there's a whale that's carrying around people in a so-called whale bus. I looked at that picture and, of course, I laughed at the beginning, but then I tried to figure out, hmm, if we know retrospectively how everything turned out to be, how can we look at all those pictures and figure out if there were any indicators back then already to show that this won't come true? And I came to the conclusion that you can look at two different things to figure that out. The first one is research and science. In this picture, for example, you can look at how the domestication of whales was back then, how the science about it was. People tried, but there were no signs of successful attempts. The second point is the need for it. As we know today, we, don't have, we didn't have to move into the oceans yet. And, but what we can say retrospectively is that if you look closer at the science, they tried to conquer the oceans, but with machines, which ultimately led to the submarine. Let's go to the next one. Those are aerial firemen. 1900 was a big year for aerial history because the Wright brothers were working on it, the first flights were tried, and so a lot of pictures from that time are about conquering the air. Regarding the need, fires were still one of the greatest threats to cities to be destroyed, so there was a high need for it. But if you see it today, it didn't make too much sense to send people alone up there, but with those machines that were created afterwards, we could do that. This is a great one. They nailed it. So you have a farmer there working on his buttons to plow his field. And regarding the science of agriculture, agriculture was, was with humanity almost 10,000 years and it was very important for humanity to feed their people. And as you can imagine from this, if many people work on a problem that is really needed by, the humani by humanity, they come to faster conclusions. And so they steadily improved this process. And today, a farmer can feed more than 150 people per farmer and back then it was just four. That one's also great. Electric scrubbing. I find that so amusing because you can order some of them today on the internet and they don't even need human operation. But let's leave the event to a great quote from this man, Nikola Tesla. He said in a magazine, we shall be able to communicate with one another instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but through television and telephony, we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face, despite intervening distances of thousands of miles. That's really great because as this event is filmed live, people can watch all over the world me speaking here. Also, he describes a device that is very simple with this technology, and a man will be able to carry one in his vest pocket. You can, of course, think of the device that is in your pocket, which is not a vest, but in your trousers. To make a point regarding Tesla, today we know, of course, he was one of the leading scientists 
of his time. He knew all the research papers, and working with electricity, he was on the edge of technology. Also, as be because he was a businessman, he tended to ask people what they needed. He knew both things, and in a sense, you could say he lived in the future of that time. What can we take from this talk except this party trick from the beginning? I wanted to show you these pictures to give you some perspective and escape your thoughts about the future. I want to give you some tools as well. So for the research, of course, as there are a lot of students here in this audience, there are many platforms that host the latest science and publications, and you can just look them up. If you are interested in predicting a topic in a certain field, just look up the science, do the research. Regarding the need, there's also a tool. Today, in 2018, we are searching for everything on search engines. This data is really interesting because people put their needs and desires in these tiny boxes and enter them onto a server. Google actually allows you to look up this data and see it in comparison. For example, here you can see two graphs, even seasonal, that if you compare swimming with ski, swim with ski, you can see that in the winters, people are searching for skis, and in the summers, they are searching for swim. If you take my examples here, Underwater transportation is even on this map. Flying firemen is at zero, but farm robots are in pretty high demand. So next time, if someone wants to tell you something about the future, or you want to think about the future, ask yourself if it's a whale bus or a farm robot. Thank you.